I've heard such wonderful feedback about the early morning sessions. Uh, and uh, it, you all were wonderful attendees. You got up early and went to those sessions, and it sounds like it was very rewarding. So I'm glad uh, you learned uh, quite a bit this morning already. And we're very, very fortunate to have another wonderful keynote speaker. This is the creative uh, keynote that I talked about yesterday. We had the inspiration with Cedric, and now we're going to hear about creative solutions. I know in some of your workshops this morning, I stuck my head in, and you were looking down the road at where 4 is going or may not be going, and how we continue to build a workforce to professionalize social work and serve children and families. I was wondering how many of you had a chance to read the paper this morning. Anybody? OK. Uh, just to tell you um, a couple things that caught my eye real quick is some veterans have invisible wounds. And it talks about the fact that um, PTSD is increasing uh, 160,000 soldiers are coming back from the wars that are going to need help from social workers. So there's some excellent new textbooks out on military social work that uh, I've received. Uh, there's a, a wonderful uh, six hour CEU um, uh, videotape course you can take. It's available in Texas. I don't know if it's been around. Has anyone seen it around the country? Uh, but it's something. Uh, I'll see if we can post it on our website. But that's another field that, of child and family services that we're going to be working in. And then also yesterday, as you know, I talked some about Hurricane Ike. And there, another piece uh, is talking about, it says, since Hurricane Ike made landfall September 13, 2008, the residents on Bolivar Peninsula Bolivar Peninsula is uh, just about a mile from Galveston, and it was totally wiped off the face of the earth uh, during the hurricane. Last week, they got their first services for eye care. <clears throat> Good thing I don't live on Bolivar Peninsula. So the, the community's coming back, and again, we thank you for joining us in Galveston to help with this uh, effort. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce to you uh, the president of the University of Houston downtown. And I'm going to tell you a little story. I was sitting in the um, employee health services uh, building that we had at New Mexico State University several years ago, waiting to get my flu shot from Virginia. And this gentleman sat down next to me on these, and as I still remember, hard plastic chairs. And he said he was there to get his flu shot, and he introduced himself to me as uh, uh, Bill Flores, the new provost at New Mexico State University. Okay, now a lot of you are administrators, and you know that when universities interview provosts and president, we're very busy and we don't go hear all their presentations and so forth, and maybe we glance at their vitas, because we know they're probably not going to come to the social work department to find out who to hire as a provost. So I plead guilty. I knew we were in the process, but I was busy. We were starting our new graduate program. We had our 4E going, and I had glanced at the vita. So I began visiting with this gentleman, very friendly, very down to earth, and he says, and, and what are you doing? I said, I'm the director of the School of Social Work. And he says, oh, wonderful. And he says, uh, now where are you with accreditation with the Council on Social Work Education? I'm like, uh. And then he starts talking about the National Association of Social Workers. I'd served on both national boards. I never heard of Bill Flores. And then I baccalaureate program directors. I never heard of Bill Flores. Then I'm thinking, I just joined NAD, the, the deans and directors, and I never heard of Bill Flores. And he keeps talking about social work and Karen Haynes, who was the dean at the University of Houston. And I'm like, 
Oh my God, I thought when I glanced at his Vita that he, had, he was a political scientist from Stanford. How, does he, how did I miss that he's a social worker? And he goes on and he's talking about the DSM-4 and I'm like, and I'm like almost breaking out in a sweat and I'm like, <laughs> where's Virginia to give me my shot quick so I can get out of here? And, it's, and so Virginia calls me, I get my shot, and I immediately beeline back to the office and pulled his Vita out of, you know, the circular filing cabinet. And I look at it, sure enough, this guy's got a PhD from Stanford University, and he's uh, been a dean and so forth, and I see no social work. And then I notice he ran a mental health center, and I go, Oh, maybe he learned something about social work there. Well, as it turned out, as I got to know him, I realized that he's a Renaissance man. I can mention any topic, and he can tell you all about it. And he's an incredibly engaging individual, as many of you saw last night during the reception. Uh, and on top of all of that, of uh, being knowing all these things, he has actually increased the number of faculty since becoming president at the University of Houston downtown during a time where our governor and legislature has slashed higher education. I have no idea how he does it. He must have a magic wand somewhere, but he's been able to maintain our faculty and, and, uh, and increase our students and our increased student financial aid while at the same time being called to the White House and other national uh, meetings as an expert on higher education. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of that background and uh, to let you know that that was one time I was eager to get a shot. And, <laughs> and I could tell you now I'm even more eager to be working at the University of Houston downtown with this gentleman, Dr. William V. Flores, President. Thank you. Well, Elvin is very kind. And you know, uh, since he's been kind about me, let me, let me reciprocate. Uh, how many of you have known Elvin for more than a decade? How many of you have known him for more than 20 years? All right, there's a few of you and you still keep coming back. <laughs> Alvin is a, is, is a great friend. And, uh, you know, I, I got to know him at New Mexico State University uh, when we opened up a center in Albuquerque. Um, it was, I was trying to get a, uh, a tenured faculty member to go up there, and it was, it was so hard. And then Alvin volunteered. And he built a very strong social work program, master, uh, master's program, in the Albuquerque Center. We added uh, other degree programs. We had a vibrant distance education program. Uh, I've understood because of cuts and whatever else that, that no longer exists. But what was impressive to me about Elvin and why we became very good friends and why eventually when I came down here and found out that he was organizing a conference in, in Houston, um, I agreed to, to be a keynote speaker. This was, a, you know, three years ago. And to talk about some of my experiences and beliefs about social work. And, uh, and, and we became even better friends subsequent to that. He agreed to, to come down here and help at, at, with our program uh, to set up a center for family strengths to, uh, to continue working on the national level and has just done an amazing job. And uh, it, it's great to have him as a friend. But you know, the, 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 the thing about it too is he really understands Title IV-E. You know, this is a guy that actually helped write the legislation for Title IV-E that helped understand and implement uh, the, the, uh, the programs at different institutions, helped develop them and, and, and consult uh, with, with several institutions, and not just in Texas and, and, and in New Mexico, but elsewhere as well. Um, and he has shared his knowledge of 
of 4E and over 30 institutions from Alaska to California to Florida to Maryland, Vermont, the Midwest. I'm always running into somebody that said, you know, if it wasn't for Elvin, we would not have a 4E program. He helped us get the funding, he helped us design it, and he helped us implement it. And then with conferences like this, to learn about some of the best practices going on throughout the conference. So please give Elvin a hand as well. You know, when, when I thought about social work, and I, 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 Elvin and I come from a similar vein in that philosophically, we're seeing in this country, um, it's a turn that is, a, is not a good one. It is, it is one that is filled with uh, anger and sometimes vicious attacks on the poor, uh, demonizing them. And as if um, the problems that they have are not problems that anybody else has. But banks and what has taken place with the recession has meant more people who were from the middle class are now homeless or have been forced to go through foreclosure. Lack of insurance, medical insurance, has meant that the largest reason, the main reason, for foreclosures has been lack of medical insurance. I've seen my, my, uh, my aunt go through that, where she's had to sign over her home uh, to the hospital. And as soon as she dies, and they can hardly wait, they'll take her home, California. We're seeing situations where there are cuts, dramatic cuts, in funding for, for uh, medical aid and for, for Medicare and for uh, any kind of support services. You know, I believe that social work is vital to problem solving, to helping people deal with problems, but I think it's even vital beyond that. And that is to address those problems. You know, when the concept of social work isn't just about remediating a, a family's dilemma when they're facing it, which is what we, um, of course, naturally end up doing. Uh, counselors, uh, uh, social workers, psychologists, you're responding to the dilemma that families and individuals face on a daily basis. But really, when you think of it, especially as you're training students, we've got to change society. And what, what, other, what other discipline is committed to the transformation, not just problem solving on an individual level, but, but changing society? to alleviate some of those problems. Looking not just at the symptom, but the cause. What I think is that, and I don't want to go on a, a, a long about that, I, you know, I gave a keynote a couple years about it, but I really do think Title IV-E is very vital because you're, getting, you're giving an opportunity for students to work firsthand, get to, to get opportunities to, to address issues that, that otherwise they would not be exposed to. And hopefully that, that, those funds on a, on a national level will remain. But if we don't advocate for that funding, who will? If social workers are not advocating for the continuation of that funding, who's going to? If the, if the, ins, if the organizations that you are working with and your students serve are not advocating that for that funding. Who's going to? And so I think, again, it's not about just the individual or the, the problem that individual faces, but it's, it's about advocacy as well. And I, I hope that, that uh, in this conference you'll learn from each other, you'll learn how the programs got set up, but, f but also, how do you work together to continue funding for those programs? And not just for 4E. 
but for the important services. We're going to see, a, we are seeing a cliff right now because of the Congress is not on either side willing to make compromises. And they're going to go into a situation where there are going to be massive cuts if they don't act soon. Where are those massive cuts going to come? They're already coming on the state level in social services, in education, in health care. Where are the layoffs coming? Teachers, nurses, social workers. And they're going to continue unless we do something about it. Um, as a president of the university, I'm, I regularly speak out on these issues. Maybe I shouldn't. Uh, maybe sometimes I jeopardize uh, you know, my position. But I feel strongly and passionate about it. And I want to tell you, I'm proud to be uh, president of the, of the University of Houston downtown, very diverse. We really are one of the few universities that look like the city they serve. Uh, we, we have 39% um, Hispanic, 29% African American, very similar to the proportion of the city of Houston itself. And every one of those students, every one of them, brings problems. They have family that, that often we've got undocumented students, 400 of them. We've got people that, that have to work two or three jobs and take one class a semester and it takes them 10 to 11 years to graduate. But they graduate. And, and we're helping them change their lives, just as you as social workers are helping individuals and family change their lives. And so society needs social workers. It needs higher education. It, without higher education, we're not going to have uh, the faculty and the, and the students to train, to develop new social workers. Get out there. Advocate. Make sure that we have that funding. Make sure that your students are aware so that if they're not registered, register them. This is going to be a major, this is, is already a major election. And its outcome is going to change the face of society. So as social workers, please engage and make sure we change it in the right way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Flores. And as you can see, he's an inspirational leader. And I might add, I sent him an email uh, last week. <clears throat> Excuse me. D did you all see on the BPD listserv the little survey that, one, that a student did, and I'm sorry, I forget the university, where they looked at what kind of service and, and advocacy uh, baccalaureate program programs were doing? Did you, did you all see that? And the survey was that we're mostly teaching in, in our uh, macro classes how to do small time fundraising, sort of like we did yesterday, um, and that we're not looking at macro change. Um, and by the way, I wanted to mention, thank you so much. You all raised $750 yesterday <clears throat> and as I took Les home last night I said Les you get he said I'm gonna have to make out a big shopping list I said that's right I said Saturday we'll go I said what grocery store do you want to go to and he said I hate to say it but we're gonna need to go to Walmart because they sell in bulk so I'm making the sacrifice I'm going to Walmart on Saturday <laughs> And we're going to buy $750 worth of food. And believe me, he knows how to stress, uh, stretch that dollar. And uh, your donations are going to feed hundreds of homeless people in Galveston. So thank you again for that. It's now my pleasure to actually build on President Flores' remarks in terms of advocacy and change. And again, you can read about um, David Burns and, and his work in the, uh, in, in the uh, program. But I want to tell you another little personal story. When I start to study something, I kind of look around the country 
uh, and see who's doing best practices. And so many, many years ago, I wanted to look at who was doing best practice in family preservation as we started our graduate program in 1990. And I found Iowa, Home Builders, and Michigan. I said, okay, I'm going to go visit those places. So I went up to Michigan and I met this gentleman named David Burns and Susan, who was running his program. And I found that that was an excellent program being run by the state of Michigan. A few years later, Kathy Breyer Lawson called and said, I'm now in Utah. I want to get people together. We want to look at best practice on, on how we work with consumers and families as experts and how we try to do interdisciplinary and, and, and cross systems work in creative funding. Will you help me look around and find people in our area? You know the Southwest a little bit. I said, okay, I'll look around. So I found El Paso County, <coughs> Colorado, not Texas, <laughs> okay? It threw me off too, Colorado Springs. And they had just hired this new fellow named David Burns. He had retired from Michigan and he was, showed up in Colorado Springs. So I said, well, why don't we get him on board? He was doing a great job in Michigan. So we invited him to join us in this four-state project. So we would meet about every other month, I guess, and I would saddle up to David Burns and find out what he was doing. And he's telling me all these wonderful stories and how he was using TANF to provide family preservation services. And I'm like, how do you do that? And so early on, he said, well, you all come to Colorado Springs and we'll meet here. I said, great. So <clears throat> we stayed at the hotel right across the parking lot from the county office building, the, the, um, Colorado's county administered. We walked in and that morning, typical state or county office building, you know, that what kind of green is that, institutional green. Uh, went up to the bulletproof glass and talked through, and they never make them the right height for me or David. So I'm like kneeling down, <coughs> Alvin Salee here for our meeting on uh, best practices, and the, metal, the, the uh, hard plastic chairs, the linoleum, the typical yucky building you want to walk into. Went in, we had the meeting, great, everything. We continued having meetings for a few more months. I kept hearing all these wonderful things that David was telling me about, and I thought, now I know something about this guy, but what he's telling me is, sounds unbelievable. So I said, um, David, do you mind if I come up to Colorado Springs sometime and just kind of, you don't need to spend any time with me, just let me wander around, meet with your clients, some of your staff, and so he said, oh yeah, come on up. And, and I'm going up there, and I'm kind of thinking, being a little skeptical, cynical professor, I can't believe that it's going to be as good as he's telling me. Short story, uh, the, the fast speed ahead. That morning I stayed at the hotel and, and I walk across the parking lot. And now President Flores won't believe this, but I have a pretty good sense of direction. I can get across a parking lot. I walk in the building and I look around and I went, oh, I'm in the wrong building. So I, I did not even go up to the reception desk. I turn around, I walk out, I'm like, now last time we were here was a few months ago. I walked out the front door, went to the left, went in the building. I thought, well, maybe it's that building straight ahead. So I go into that building, and it looks a little more institutionalized. And I said, um, um, I'm looking for David Burns. And they said, oh, right, but you're in the wrong building. He's in the building over here. And I'm like, that's the building I just came from. So I'm thinking Twilight Zone, you know. So I go back into that building, and it was so customer friendly. There were no more bulletproof windows. There was carpet on the floor. There were kids' toys and everything. So I went up the reception desk knowing I had to be in the wrong building. I said, I'm here to see David Byrne. She said, oh, yes, uh, here, come, just go in that door and go up the second story, and he's waiting for you the man had transferred, uh, the transformation was actually visible. I met with the families, I met with, 
and he is a very, very modest man. The change was phenomenal. So I went back, and as when we traveled at New Mexico State, you had to write a report. I wrote, I don't know, about a 15-page report, and sent it, and then sent a copy to Mr. Burns, and um, and just said a glowing report. It was unbelievable what he did. Well, a few years later, he said, "I'm going to retire." from Colorado Springs and I'm applying for a job to run the Department of Economic Security in Arizona would you mind serving as a reference I said I'd be honored to so a few weeks later I get a call from the governor's office now this is the governor who was born in New Mexico uh, governor not the Polano not the current governor and this woman from the governor's office says we're looking for the governor is very concerned about child abuse and we want to hire someone who will in so many words come in and rescue these kids and put them in foster homes and I'm thinking ooh how do I finesse this because this man does not believe in that model and so I explained to her that there was a new way of thinking and maybe this wasn't the best way to go but uh, David Burns was the right man to turn that system around and if you notice in the program, that's not a typo. The Department of Economic Security has 10,000 employees. It's a huge umbrella agency. He went in there, he turned it around. I hear he's retiring again. So next thing I know, he's at Casey Foundation, and now he's traveling around to all these states, sharing his creative ideas with them. And uh, we talked a little bit and so forth. And then I was a meeting with our planning committee with Patrick and, and Joe and, and uh, Arnetta and I'm and saying, who can we get that is going to be really creative? And I said, well, David Burns, he, he's working with the Casey Foundation. So I call him up. They said, uh, no, he's retired. I'm like, how many times does this guy retire? I'm not using him as a model for retirement. <laughs> Believe me. And so uh, I thought, he can't really retire. Well, I think he retired for maybe a month or so. He rode his motorcycle around. I figured maybe he's back in Michigan in his retirement home. And I track him down. <clears throat> no, he's now in charge of the welfare department for the city of in Washington, D.C., one of the most troubled agencies in the country. So I called him up, and I said, and, and, nicely I think what the heck are you thinking <laughs> and he said the mayor here has a vision and it's something where I can again look at systems change I said wonderful would you come and meet with us and talk to us about the creative approaches that you're taking and he said sure and uh, he if you notice he came early he's been listening to you all and I'm really looking forward to hearing what he has to say. Let me welcome the, uh, Mr. David Burns. Good morning. I am a social worker. That's my professional identity. That's uh, how I view myself. I've worked in the field of child welfare for virtually all of my career. That's been the focus of my work. In uh, many instances I've had, as Elvin eloquently described and very, very kindly, uh, a number of positions. Those are not my identity. Those are simply the ways that I carry out that mission and the, the vision of being a social worker. So I, I've uh, really had a great run in my 42 years working in this field and feel very honored and privileged to be with you today. I say those things also because I intend to be maybe a little bit controversial at times, and so I want you to view me as an insider, as a family member, <laughs> uh, not as somebody out to attack, but uh, maybe just uh, a, a few fresh eyes and uh, terms to uh, take a, a little different look at the way we do our business. 
I have retired four times. Uh, it was uh, just over a year ago, I actually early in uh, 2011, that I was out on my motorcycle uh, uh, touring New Mexico and Texas, and I got a call from the mayor's office in Washington, D.C. And uh, first off, we talked about child welfare uh, in running those programs, and really I have been there and done that, and that wasn't really the focus of what I wanted to do. I would prefer actually to just staying on my motorcycle. <laughs> but uh, when I actually met with the mayor and with the deputy mayor in Washington, D.C., he said, well, we have another position. Uh, the city council has recently passed new legislation implementing the TANF program for the city of Washington, D.C. I said, uh, it, that law passed in 1996. Uh, <laughs> Well, the city of Washington, D.C. never implemented it. For, for all of the right reasons, uh, they felt that it was a bit repressive, and uh, so they never put in time limits. They never put in um, strong work requirements or the things that were a lot of the basis of the, uh, the TANF program. And then uh, uh, the former mayor and current city council member, Marion Barry, uh, many of you have probably heard of him. He's famous and infamous in some ways, but uh, uh, he uh, is the chair or the council member over the, uh, the poorest part of the city of Washington, D.C., came to the realization that we had lost our sense of urgency in, in the city, that by not having any expectations around uh, it being a temporary program uh, and without having strong work expectations that was supported by a lot of resources to help people move forward, we still had many of the same families receiving uh, public assistance for, uh, that were receiving it 15 years ago. And so uh, we had a PANF program in Washington, D.C. That's permanent assistance to needy families. And uh, I think we all came to the same conclusion that nobody deserves to be on TANF. Not because they're not deserving people, but because if you're raising your kids at 40% of poverty, that is in no way, shape, or form what would be good enough for your family, what would be good enough for my family, or what should be good enough for any family, especially uh, in our nation's capital. So the idea was to get a new sense of urgency. So, and again, again, in my discussions with the mayor, he didn't have a vision of eliminating welfare, but rather of eliminating poverty for the city. And uh, it was clear that he was offering me a position to be the primary prevention program for child welfare for the city with hundreds of millions of dollars, influence over billions of dollars of other funding, to uh, be the prevention program for juvenile justice and other deep end programs, and to be a main player in the community in all of the prevention efforts that even kept uh, people from coming into the welfare system. I know that's not the way you would normally describe what the title or the role of the director of the Department of Human Services was, but it gave me and him and others a chance to reframe and redefine what business we were in. And coming to the conclusion that the business that we were in was not just running the nation's best PANF or TANF program, but rather serving as a prevention and uh, as the economic supports for so many of the other programs. Because you know that a family that's uh, in the child welfare system, and I'm going back to some old statistics, I haven't seen the most recent, but a poor family is 22 times as likely to be in the child welfare system as a non-poor family. Not 22 percent, 22 times uh, as likely to be in the child welfare system. So if we can address the issues of poverty, we would have a much better chance 
of uh, keeping the families own of programs that not a one of them in my whole career has ever said, gosh, I would love to be a child welfare family, or I'd love to be a foster kid, or uh, I'd love to have my kids taken away from me, or whatever the stereotype or feeling is about child welfare. Uh, it's not a system where people and families want to be, so it gave us a chance to reframe and figure out how to support the families before they ever came into the system. I'd like to... Uh, uh, Alvin said I'm a, a humble person. That's far from the truth. Uh, but uh, I would like to, to uh, give a disclaimer. I want to give some of the programs and areas where I have been associated with a great deal of success. Not my own, but the communities, the families, the, uh, the staff uh, coming together and accomplishing a lot of things. I, I usually would save that to, till the end to tell you, you know, build up to the crescendo and then say, uh, this is what really happened. But the, I lose people in the, in the meantime, so I'm going to take from the end of my speech and move it to the beginning and tell you what we've accomplished and then we'll come back and tell you how we got there and what it really took different philosophically to, uh, to make those changes. And, you know, uh, uh, Alvin said that uh, Cedric uh, gave the inspirational talk uh, yesterday and uh, uh, Bob is going to give the talk about the best practice in the effective way, so all I have to be is creative. I don't have to be inspirational or, or, or effective. So I'll, I'll tell you some of the things that we've done uh, and then how, how we actually got there. And I am a rebel. Uh, I don't wait for permission very often, so uh, uh, these, these are uh, some of the things. And th these are kind of random uh, not even in chronological order, but some of the things that I've been most proudly to be associated with. In Michigan, um, when I was the state child welfare director there for seven years, we went from uh, performing 900 adoptions per year for the whole state to uh, 2,100 uh, per year uh, during that period of time. And I'm going to come back and talk about each of these depending on how much time I have and how much I ramble on other things. But I'll talk a, a little bit about how we actually accomplished it. But uh, so th that, that was a, a major switch uh, so that uh, people like Cedric uh, really had a, a much better chance of not being stuck in the system like he was for, for so many years. Uh, I, I would also say at that time we reduced the number of kids in foster care from 17,000 in Michigan down to 13,000. There's been a lot of jurisdictions around the country that have had 50% reductions, but actually in Michigan we were among the lowest to begin with, and so that, well, that was really what we thought to be a, a pretty significant accomplishment as well. Another random uh, thought from El Paso County we reduced the institutional placements of kids that uh, we had in uh, various types of group homes and mental health uh, facilities and all by over 50 percent. And uh, at the same time, we quadrupled the number of adoptions from, uh, it was 49 the year before I came. One year after I left, we were up to 230 uh, adoptions per year. And again, I'll come back and tell you a little bit about some of the creative ways that we engaged our families and our communities to accomplish that. Back in uh, Michigan and then in El Paso and in uh, Arizona, we uh, greatly increased the reunification of families by redefining uh, what business or what reunification meant. And uh, again, uh, when you remove kids, the situation is really, really terrible. I mean, you don't, uh, child welfare workers don't remove kids uh, for no reason at all. The families are really, really in crisis and the kids are in danger. And it's like this bar way down here before we'll take that kind of a gruesome action removing kids. But to get kids back, the bar is, is way up here. This is my graphics, I don't have a PowerPoint, so. <laughs> so uh, so uh, the, the, uh, the idea was that it was, 
you know, a, a real low uh, functioning of a family to get kids removed, but a real high functioning of families for them to ever get it back. So we came to the conclusion that there should be a middle bar and that family reunification services shouldn't be just trying to get the families up to this new level, but it should be up to getting them where they're just safe enough and the kids are, are stable and the families are, are stable. And then you go in with the family preservation services on the back end instead of the front end. So we took the home builders model and flipped it over and put it as a back end approach after the kids went back home and stayed with them so that they could uh, return. And, had a, a huge, and I, I saw the, some of the writings uh, that were on at the, the desk there uh, on reunifications. Uh, one of our partners, uh, Lisa Sanchusi, uh, if she's here. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, I ran across that program and it's still going on in Michigan and they served uh, many, many hundreds, I think uh, over thousands of kids on that type of a model, still very effective. Uh, one of the things that I was most uh, proud of when I went to uh, El Paso County and uh, uh, Alvin visited there was that we went from 3,800 families that were receiving TANF in one year down to 1,200. But that's not what I was proud of. It was the fact that we did it without imposing a single sanction on the families. And uh, it wasn't done because of any uh, kinds of actions like time limits but the family said left. We didn't know exactly why they left, uh, but it, you know, we were engaging and a lot of them just didn't bother to come back in because they got jobs and it wasn't to their advantage to tell us necessarily why, but uh, the, the caseloads went down considerably during that time, again, without the use of sanctions or time limits. Way back early in my career when I was a county director in Michigan, uh, we redesigned the welfare uh, programs, the old AFDC programs, uh, using a community-based approach and uh, get, getting families involved in their own case plans. And that's become the model that I use in El Paso and now in Washington, D.C. And uh, I, I learned way back then, I had been an employment worker and all as a caseworker earlier in my career, I learned I never got anybody a job. Uh, I could only provide the encouragement. They almost always found their own employment. So rather than trying to do all of the assessment myself, I tried to provide the opportunities for people to lead their own way. And so uh, that actually became the model for the new TANF program. And I had the chance, because of that experience, to help even write what none of us uh, thought was a great uh, bill, but the, the current TANF legislation uh, and so uh, that, that was uh, one of those successes. Uh, one of them that may be uh, of uh, particular interest uh, to this uh, group of things that we accomplished uh, was back, I didn't have a master's in social work when I started my career. Uh, I had a bachelor's in psychology and I was a uh, uh, a welder at Fisher Body. Uh, that's how I, I got myself, uh, worked uh, my way through college. I was married, had a family, and uh, after I, uh, and General Motors paid my tuition. So I, I was really uh, very happy that uh, I had a, an employer that saw the benefit of increased education. But we went on on strike, and I had the, uh, uh, the chance to take a job as an eligibility worker over at the welfare office, the FDC program for the strikers and the other community members. It was a big nationwide strike. And so uh, I went into that program uh, and uh, uh, that's how I got into the career. But when I started working on community-based approaches in that county, uh, some of my social work friends said, well, you'll never really re rise within this industry until you get your union card. Well, I had a union card, I was UAW. <laughs> but uh, she said, no, the, the union you have to be in is the union of social workers. You need your MSW. Uh, and uh, so uh, I didn't have a great undergraduate career, but she and others helped me to uh, uh, get temporarily uh, uh, conditionally admitted to the School of Social Work at Michigan State uh, University. And uh, I had to take 10 credits first. Uh, and 
this, the state had a tuition refund plan even for that. So uh, again, I was thankful to my employer that helped me uh, uh, get into the MSW program. But uh, as I uh, uh, went through and I had a great uh, field placement, I, on the weekends and the evenings they were flexible enough, but they said I would never be able to finish my career or, or my MSW program on a part-time basis, I said, try to catch me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but in the middle of my second, and they allowed me to use my job, uh, a, a different type of my job as the second year field placement. But just as I was beginning that second year field placement, I was appointed as the county social services director up in Marquette, Michigan. 400 miles away from the uh, uh, from the School of Social Work. So I talked to my board and said, really, it's important. And they said, we want you to get your MSW. What will it take? I talked to the school. I was able to consolidate my classes into just one uh, classes on, on Mondays. And they allowed me to use my job as my field placement because it was social work administration concentration. And they could not figure out how being a county director did not meet the criteria for the social work administration. So uh, my field placement was as a county director, my supervisor was an MSW, and I flew back to, uh, to Lansing from Marquette every weekend, uh, or sometimes drove in order to, to complete it. But what, how great it was that my board allowed me, the state uh, allowed the tuition refund, and my staff uh, supported me in, uh, for the, the last uh, time. But, it gave me the sense that, yes, people are really supporting me. What more can I do to support my staff? So I looked at my, uh, my staff there, and I had one or two master's level people that were working in services positions uh, out of about 30. And, uh, and so what I was most proud of, and I think we can come back to this later, is that when I left, virtually every one of them had a master's degree. And uh, I'll, I'll come back to uh, how we uh, accomplished that. But uh, then the, uh, another accomplishment that uh, I'll spend more time on is that a after 11 years as the county director there, I got appointed as the state child welfare director in Michigan and looked around and found out that very, very few of my staff had master's degrees, especially in social work. And, uh, and I had schools of social work uh, asking for stipends uh, and 4E and, uh, and all of that going on. And I said, that's great, but what am I going to do about the uh, uh, 1,500 current staff that I already have that don't have master's degrees? And uh, by the time I left, over 300 of them were uh, enrolled and working on their master's degrees and actually got them. and. Well, well into uh, many hundreds after I, I actually left completed that program. And again, I know that's of interest to you how that works, so I'll come back. Uh, so anyway, those are uh, a few of the highlights, and I'll go into more detail uh, on depending on how much time I, I have at the end. But uh, from uh, what I've, uh, I've said, I, I, I know that there's a lot of people that will wonder, well, you made changes, you've had these accomplishments, but uh, we don't know what it has to do with what we're doing, and yes, you uh, were very fortunate to be the director and able to pull all of those things uh, off, but we can't possibly do it. And I've got a list of reasons why I've been told that uh, uh, this can't happen. One is that you can only do it because of your position, that you're the director. Uh, another uh, common one, well, if you would come and be our director, and this is very humbling and nice, then we could do it together. Uh, and, uh, so, you know, that, that's very nice to say, but it, it's not going to happen. Uh, uh, and, of course, it would never happen in our jurisdiction because of, and you fill in the blanks of uh, why these approaches or whatever approaches you want to work on uh, would never work in your uh, Or it was a different time. You're talking about things that happened as much as 42 years ago, and uh, times have changed, and so, uh, therefore, it no longer has any relevance for us. Uh, or 
Yeah, we've already done that, and we've done it better than you anyway. <laughs> and um, an another one is, well, we don't even agree with the approach that you took. Yeah. So uh, why would we want to do that? And that's, that's fair, too, because, uh, and I don't even have a sense of ownership because they're most all, I don't think I've ever had a creative idea in my life. It's been mainly the, uh, the community's ideas that we've helped to implement. And my favorite one uh, is that, well, we're going to wait and see if Burns goes to jail before we try that one. <laughs> because it's got to be illegal. Okay, so, uh, uh, and I did wonder, you know, to what extent is that just serendipity or that, uh, you know, just because I, I've been fortunate enough to be uh, appointed to what would be considered some pretty powerful positions or whatever, uh, what, what is it that has caused us and allowed us to have as communities such great success in so many different areas? And I had a chance when I was in El Paso County to be working with a uh, management consultant, and I asked her that question. You know, what's it take to, to get the change and to sustain it and to actually be able to do different things on our jobs when it seems like we have so many rules and regulations? And she looked uh, through the management literature, and I can't document this for sure, but I... It, it makes sense to me. She said, Dave, I got some good news and some bad news for you. The bad news is that no matter where you are in an organization, whether you're the receptionist, a frontline caseworker, a supervisor, a program manager, a consultant, a, uh, uh, a director of an agency, 85% of what you do on the job is controlled by somebody else. You know, if you're the frontline worker, you've got your manuals, you've got uh, your supervisor, you've got uh, certain constraints and laws. But as an agency director, I've got the city council, I've got the mayor, I've got all of the federal regulations. I answer to my constituents as well as to the people that, uh, that hire me. And so even as the director, 85% of what I do is controlled by somebody else. But she went on to say, but the good news is, no matter where you are in an organization, 15% of what you do on the job is controlled by yourself. And that's the attitude that you have, the creativity that you bring to the job, the fact that you smile at other people, your ability to hear the same story a dozen times every day and react as if it's the same, for the fresh story, the first time you ever heard it. Uh, and so uh, I also realized that within my 15%, I have the chance to keep that 15% and to share it and give it to other people because that's my choice. And then I might be able to, con to, to increase their ability or their control up to 17%. Because a lot of the frontline workers, uh, uh, 15 or 85% is part of my 15%. So the more I can uh, shove off to other people, the, uh, the more power that they have. And I st actually don't give up anything. I still have my 15%, probably even more, as their control goes up, so does mine. So that, that, that's one of the, the main thoughts and premises that uh, has come to mind over the, the years. So when you say, well, we could never do that, you're right. I don't want to do that, you're right. It wouldn't work in my community uh, for various reasons, you're right. But there are 15% of the things that you're doing that you can change. So um, uh, one of the things that... I uh, learned and the way to implement this was that I've always told my staff and I had a lawyer standing next to me when I said this and, and uh, in, uh, in Arizona the lawyer happened to be Governor Janet Napolitano who is now the head of Homeland Security one of the nation's most renowned uh, lawyers and, and leaders and she heard and supported and completely blessed if it's the right thing to do, if you have been told 
not been told, uh, or have you been told, uh, how am I going to say, if you haven't been told not to do it, okay, so uh, it's the right thing to do, you haven't been told not to do it, and it's not illegal, then just go ahead and do it. Now, the, the, the first thing is if it's the right thing to do. Uh, because, and if you have to hide it, it's probably really not the right thing to do. <laughs> so, you know, talk to your supervisors. Get the community behind you. But don't wait. If you have manuals, never look to them to tell you what you should do. Manuals only tell you what you can't do and what you have to do. They never tell you what you should do. And there's, uh, there's, no matter how much you write, and I've written a lot of manuals, no matter how much you try to control people, you can't put enough in a manual to control and to even get rid of their 15%. So, uh, so there, you know, don't look at your manuals. Look if it's the right thing to do and find out what it is that you can move forward with. Now, uh, I have some other general principles that I, I threw out as we were designing, and I've learned them all over the years, so I don't know when I learned them, where I learned them from, and I can't document them. I'm not a researcher, and I'm not a social work uh, uh, professor or anything like that, so uh, I can't give you the sites to, to a lot of this stuff. But I did know, do know that the outcomes that we need to uh, work on often we think are the outcomes that are included in federal laws and in uh, our contracts and all. Well, those are part of like the manual. Those are things that you absolutely have to do. We have to have a different mindset around the outcomes. And I, I always ask, well, what will be different? And, and people will say, well, well, we'll have this many more students in our classes or their grades will raise or, or whatever. And I say, well, that, that's what you're measured by, but what will be different for the children and the families that we serve? And until you can get down to the vision of what will be different for the children and families that we're serving, I don't even want to talk about what it is that you're, you're working on. Let, let, let's figure out the overall global vision and then come back to uh, what we're going to accomplish. So. Uh, just measuring our outcome, and just as an example, in, uh, in Washington, D.C., when I went in, we were struggling. We only have about 5% of our clients that are meeting our federal work participation rates, and yet we were, we were always pushing people to make sure they get at least 32 hours of uh, actual employment, or on a very limited basis, you can count some type of training or, uh, or job preparation, but only for a short period of time. And then we took and said, okay, so that must be the plan for all of our clients, and that's what was imposed on everybody. On the first day I came to the job, it says, federal work participation rates apply to me. They don't apply to a single client. We threw them out in terms of how they are included in the case plan. I said, and, and, and I've done this in, a lot, in Michigan, Colorado, Arizona, and everybody said, well, you know, that, he may not go to jail, but he'll get fired because he won't be able to meet the federal work participation rates. We blew everybody out of the water every time we uh, stopped worrying about the federal work participation rates because when you start saying people will have a plan, they have to do uh, something, but the something that they do full time is what they decide is going to make them successful. And whatever they and their case manager comes up with as their plan will uh, fully meet and satisfy their TANF requirements, then uh, that's, uh, that's good enough for us. And as it turns out, when you start worrying more about what people need in order to be successful, they start making me and the agency look more successful because they actually have jobs and uh, are meeting the work participation. That's just a, uh, an example of how that certain premise works. Uh, an another thing that I think is quite different uh, in the way that I try to look at things is the whole philosophy of abundance. 
there's plenty of money in human services to accomplish what we need to accomplish. Now we could use more, and there's always things that uh, can be done differently, but the problem is that we get such deplorable outcomes so often, and those outcomes are so much more expensive uh, than the, uh, the good outcomes that family deserve, that if we think creatively, we can take the resources that we have and use in a different fashion and get better outcomes. So, uh, you know, this plays out in a couple of different ways. One, Elvin said I went to Colorado Springs. Some of you may have gone, <gasps> nation's most conservative community. Uh, they haven't elected a Democrat to any office in anybody's uh, uh, memory. Uh, five military bases, uh, the home of various uh, uh, religious uh, organizations focus on the family and a whole lot of others like that. Anyway, uh, one of the things that uh, we were able to accomplish, I said, I will never ask you to spend another cent on human services. I will only ask you to invest in better outcomes. Because if we can get more of our people in as tax paying rather than tax taking the citizens and all, I, I had to learn to be bilingual. I had to be able to talk both conservative and uh, uh, liberal, both uh, Democrat and Republican. But, uh, but anyway, we had uh, to, to use the, the language and the philosophy to engage that particular community in what was the, uh, a united vision. And the county commissioners adopted the vision, not only for our department, but uh, as part of their broader vision, to eliminate poverty and family violence, which was pretty much unheard of uh, in Colorado Springs to have the, the five uh, county commissioners uh, in that conservative community embracing such, uh, uh, I think, a progressive vision. So the, the idea of abundance also plays out into what we would consider advocacy. And one of the things that I've learned over the years, and, and I talk to people like you and other members of the community and clients and other agencies, and I say, as social workers, as people that care, as recipients, you absolutely have to maintain your advocacy. We need your voice. But there are some things that I have to tell you from our vantage point. We're already getting hundreds of millions of dollars into our agency. If the city council, if the state legislature, if the governor, all they hear about your uh, Department of Child and Family Services, your Department of Human Services, whatever it's called in your um, state, is squandering that money, is, uh, is ineffective, is doing a, a poor job. Do you think they're going to dump more money down that rat hole? And the, the answer is no. They have to see that they're getting something from their investment. So uh, I encourage advocates to keep the message strong and powerful, but find some things that the agency's doing well and, uh, and say, this is what, what they and we as a team have been able to accomplish, and with this many more resources, you can invest and get even better results. So it's, a, it's, it's helping to change the voice of advocacy, and not to say that to make it all Pollyannish or uh, that there's nothing wrong, but you have to concentrate on what you're going to get from an incremental increase in your funding or from even delaying a, a cut or preventing a cut. And if you can't do that, then they'll probably say, well, then that program's ripe for cut because nobody really supports it anyway. Uh, another part of the philosophy uh, is that uh, uh, redefining our business and I, I touched on this before, uh, I have to see my job as not just running the best TANA for homeless or, uh, or, or protective services programs, whatever my head job happens to be, but start asking the questions of, if I fail, who's going to get my clients next? 
and who already failed that caused him to come to me in the first place. And my job, I figure, is 30% at the top, not, not all of my staff, but as the director, is to spend 30% of my time running the agency to have the very best TANF program, the very best homeless program, to keep on top of the management, and 70% to prevent kids from going into child welfare and juvenile justice, or to improve the schools, the employment, the housing stock, and all to keep families from ever getting into the welfare system in the first place. So redefining my job as, uh, as prevention for somebody else and for strengthening those that are the prevention for my, job, uh, for my services uh, it gives us a whole different way of arranging and thinking about the investments that we're going to make with the limited dollars that we have in our programs. But everybody else has to start thinking about it too. Child welfare is a prevention for programs, for uh, uh, the criminal justice system, for juvenile justice, for uh, uh, even for poverty. Because if you can uh, keep kids safe and secure and, and uh, flourishing, they're not going to be on that circle coming back around and entering the, uh, the, the programs as homeless uh, kids and on the street after they finish their career in child welfare. So it's a uh, uh, redefining our jobs. And I, uh, we had some of these discussions yesterday in what is the job of the 4E program. If you think that uh, it's exclusively running a 4E training program or a 4E stipend program, you probably missed the richness of what you're doing. You are an anti-poverty program. You're a family strengthening program. It's not how many credits you get or how much money you bring in, but the raw resources that you're molding into somebody that will go out and actually make a difference in the children and in the families and in the communities that's going to make huge changes in society. So that's your job is to make huge changes in, uh, in society, and you happen to do it by running the very best Title IV-E program, uh, which is one element in a huge part of a child welfare system. And child welfare uh, should be seen as a, an agency of last resort. We often, as agency-centered administrators, think that we are the most important thing that uh, ever has occurred in a family's life. Well, if we're that important, we have really missed our job and redefined uh, or uh, defined our job uh, improperly because if we can uh, support their families and their communities and keep them from ever coming to us, that's what families would pr prefer. So redefining the emphasis of what we have and saying, gosh, I am not all that important. And uh, the less important I can become in a family's life the better that family will be. But when I do get them, I still have to do the very, very best job that I possibly can have. We cannot have any more Cedrics aging out of the system after 20 years of uh, benign neglect. So uh, another part uh, on uh, partnerships that I've learned. Uh, not only do, as I'm spending that 70% of my time outside of the agency, I'm, I'm trying to spend a whole lot more time not going out and trying to recruit the mental health system to do this much more for my agency, the schools to do this much for my agencies, but asking first, what is it that you're trying to accomplish? And uh, Stephen Covey uh, has it, you know, seek first to understand before trying to be understood. And I, and I would build on that and say, seek first to serve before trying to be served. And so uh, if, uh, if I need mental health to, uh, to be better or substance abuse treatment to be better, my first job should be asking them, what more do you need from the poverty programs, from the things that I run that will make your treatment programs better? How am I getting in your way? You know, there's all sorts of treatment programs in, uh, in all of our communities. And uh, often all they need is transportation to get there. 
I can provide that, but uh, the, a lot of times I'll say, but I want to open a case file, assign a case manager to get a transportation voucher. I, I'll say one thing to, uh, to those of you that are uh, social work educators, and maybe this is controversial. You're teaching all of us how to be case managers. When are you going to teach us how to be case managed? There's so many families that have 10 of us assigned to them, and, uh, and they're confused. I've had clients actually uh, call and say, uh, we want, not to me, but to my staff, uh, we'd like you to come over, and, uh, and they get there, and there's 8 or 10 other people there, and say, you're all my case managers, I'd like to introduce you to each other. Uh, because uh, everybody, we all think that we're so important in their lives that we have to have an open case and a plan. Well, maybe the plan is just for us to give them a transportation voucher or child care. And, uh, and in Washington, D.C., one of the most important things that we've done is I said anybody that has a case manager will deputize them. If you have somebody you love that you're working with, uh, and they're willing to just to do about 15 minutes a month to report back to us so that I can keep my job uh, and, uh, and, and keep the, the statistics. Whatever you and that person comes up with is good enough for me. And it's good enough for our program. And uh, we're using that as a model and encouraging other agencies to do the same so that there's, uh, hopefully we'll get to the point of one case manager. At, at this point, we're just saying one less case manager. But, but even there, because uh, you know, this is uh, crucial to their financial need, that uh, families will choose who will be their primary, will deputize them and give them just the minimal training they need in order to report back in. But whatever they decide is, and uh, if it's full time, and, and then if they just need the transportation or the uh, uh, the child care or some other ancillary service, we don't have to have another case manager. They're able to work through our system to authorize it. Another part of this on the giving the family the strength is that not only do they choose, but they can fire. That if, uh, if they thought that their case manager over at the housing authority was going to be just perfect and that person just isn't working out, go ahead and choose somebody else and I only I have 15,000 families that we're trying to get or adults that we're trying to get jobs in our TANF program and enough money to have 3,000 paid contracted case managers for I'm getting some more money but uh, that's another story but not nearly enough to serve everybody so this is on the self-defense that I'm deputizing everybody else but it's also uh, because it's much better for the families and if they uh, do want one of our contracted case managers, if that's the last resort, they can have that, or if they can go to somebody else, but it's their own plan. We also have a full sanction policy, the families were never sanctioned. And again, I was proud in El Paso County that we, we had a full family sanction policy, never, never had to use it, because families negotiated their own plan if they didn't follow the plan, that was our foot in the door to social workers to say, you know, this was your plan, you created it, and you're not following it. Is there something you didn't tell me? And that's where you find out about domestic violence and uh, uh, substance abuse problems or school or performance issues or, or whatever. And then you say, well, then why don't we work on that? And that'll become your, your plan at least for the next couple of months. And, uh, and we'll get you to the point where then you can, can get back into the system. So uh, anyway, the uh, uh, point there is try to teach us uh, in our schools of social work that it's okay not to be so central and important that we have to be the case managers for everybody because everybody's getting, so many families are getting way too many of us. Uh, an another thing that uh, is, I think, very important in terms of uh, uh, redefining uh, how we do things. I I've been in welfare offices or child welfare offices in virtually every state in this nation. And I have seen so many victims. And they're not the clients, they're the staff. Because you know, we, we go out and we're underpaid. We're underappreciated. 
uh, we're overworked, uh, there's uh, uh, no way that we can accomplish everything that's uh, supposed to be accomplished, and we feel so beat up. But in some ways, that's like all of us, uh, that's why we entered this position, because we're working with disenfranchised people. It's like a urologist who doesn't like body odors. <laughs> You know, we're not victims because we're working with people who are victims. Uh, we, we, that's, that's what our job, and I had uh, one kid, he was uh, raised in the foster care system, he's now a very high aide within a congressman's office in, in Washington, D.C., who said, if you think this is a job, get another job. Th this is a calling, this is a mission. And uh, so, uh, if, if you can't see a sense of hope in your own life and in what you're doing, then you probably have uh, uh, no chance of showing that hope and vision and sense that uh, to your clients that they can accomplish something. Because if you can't do it with a full-time job with, uh, with benefits, uh, those of us that have benefits, uh, how, how can we get that, uh, that sense that there is hope and an opportunity for those that we're serving? So. Uh, let's try to get rid of that victim mentality. Realize that we entered this profession because we want to work with those that, and not to accept it, but, but that's why we're here and that's what we're trying to accomplish is to get people uh, so that they can succeed. So, one of the, uh, the uh, areas uh, and I can tell right now I'm not going to get into all of the specific examples that I had ex expected to, to get to, but uh, the, the process for, uh, for systems change that, that uh, I have followed that's allowed for the development of more creativity has been to make sure we negotiate what we're trying to accomplish. I alluded to that, uh, ask not what's important for us from the people that fund us and all, but what's really important for the people that uh, are our calling that we're trying to serve. Let them define, and if they can tell us what will be different and how they know as a result of our work, then we have a much better chance of uh, accomplishing it. But those of us in leadership positions then have to not have another blue ribbon commission to then design a system that uh, meets all of their, their goals. I can tell you, every job I've ever had, I've had a whole shelf full, sometimes a whole bookcase full of blue ribbon commission reports that tell me everything that needs to be done. And they sometimes go back 50 years, Children's Bureau, probably 100 years uh, of everything that needs to be done. But it never got to the point of implementation, because if we had a pilot, uh, it was so expensive or we could never figure out how to replicate to, or uh, how to expand or disseminate to other areas. So I've given up on uh, blue ribbon commissions and on pilots. And once we decide what we need to accomplish, I just assign an implementation team. And uh, then the implementation team is chaired by the people who care about that issue the most. I, I can tell you right now, I am not a techie. I am not a person that understands a lot about uh, huge clouds and information systems and everything like that. But I know people who are, and I find them, and they're the champions, and I say, you gather the people that care about this. Try to get as much client representation, as much consumer and con community representation but you're in charge of that part and move it forward. In El Paso County, we used this concept. We came up with 75 things that needed to be implemented in three months in order to implement a whole new system of child welfare and a whole new system of TANF. We got that done uh, within about three and a half months time, including legislative change, if you can believe that by using champions on each of these things and moving it forward. Uh, so uh, we give them as much uh, authority 
uh, we, uh, my job then becomes to herd the cats. We have 45, 45 initiatives just on our TANF reform already in, uh, in Washington, D.C. I can't even list them without going back to all of my notes and everything, but we're assigning champions to each one of them. And uh, they don't, some of them are easy, like si changing signage or putting a new video in our uh, office. We can get that done fairly quickly. Computer system maybe is going to take five years to get fully operational. We already got $80 million out from the feds to implement a whole new cross systems uh, 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 computer system through the interoperability of the Healthcare Reform Act. I don't expect you to know what that is, but it's 80 million bucks to me. Uh, anyway, uh, turn it over to the people that care about it. Those that uh, are working as your receptionist maybe will be the chair of the committee on how people are greeted, and that's how we got a whole new front desk uh, and system. It wasn't my idea how to do it. We asked the people that were coming in what would make it more friendly, how would it work, and uh, we, we turned to the, the architects became the clients, and the staff become the engineers. You know the difference? Architects dream and see the, all the pretty things and everything. They know what it's, it's supposed to look like. But if you don't have the engineers that do the stress test and figure out exactly how big this window has to be and all of that kind of stuff, it never gets done. The staff are the only ones that know those technicalities. So we turned the engineering over to them, the vision over to the community and to our customers. Uh, so the, uh, the staff become the uh, empowered. My job is to serve them. I work for the mayor in some ways. Uh, he's the one that hired me, but the worst he can do to me is uh, put me back on my motorcycle where I came from. Uh, and, and that's also a, a lesson. Uh, uh, when I had the security to be able to uh, retire, it gave me a chance to actually just do the right thing. But as it turned out, it solidified my job so, so much better that I never had to worry uh, or not. I, I, I still didn't worry, but that, that wasn't the consideration. Uh, it, it made my job actually that much more secure by just trying to do the right thing. So taking a risk on the right thing uh, and stopping worrying about uh, uh, getting fired really does make a, uh, uh, is liber liberating for all of us. So. Uh, just uh, trying to make sure that the, the people that are most involved have the power to carry it out. I work for my top managers, but only if they work for their supervisor, the people that are the supervisors in the organization, and they only if they see as their main client and who they work for is the staff, and most importantly, only if the staff that are really relating to the clients see their job as being their supports and working for them. So I'll leave you with just uh, one last thought, and it goes back to that 85, 15%, uh, uh, and uh, uh, this isn't meant as a, a religious uh, issue, but uh, I've worked in the area of substance abuse and familiar with the serenity prayer, and that goes, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. That's our 85% the courage to change the things I can, that's the 15 percent, and the wisdom to know the difference, that's you, that's our social work education, that's what teaches us really that uh, we'll never accept an unacceptable condition and we will make a difference uh, with the things that we can change. Thank you. Thank you so much, David, and uh, I think the committee got it wrong. You are inspirational <laughs> in your speech as well as being creative. I wanted to uh, quickly uh, give you a gift from the University of Houston, uh, Central Campus, a couple <laughs> gifts. Oh, and, thank you so much. Um, I also very quickly wanted to tell you that Texas is an extremely conservative state. Uh, in 1994, we had 7,000 children in foster care when we began family preservation. We're now approaching 30,000 in foster care. 
and I think this would be a wonderful place for you to retire to uh, <laughs> where you can ride your motorcycle for miles and miles and miles. So thank you very uh, much. We so appreciate much. it. <clears throat> oh, I also wanted to know, to let everyone know, the last time I checked, Michigan State University is still accredited in spite of the rebel they graduated. 